Hello and welcome to Breaking Down Bad Books, a podcast analysing trashy bestsellers from a literary perspective, and today we're looking at chapters 56, 57, 58 and 59 of The Da Vinci Code. So where we left off, Sophie and Robert go to see Lee Teabing, and surprise, surprise, he loves a good cup of tea, and he's also the world's most preeminent Holy Grail specialist, and he just happens to live around the corner from where the person hiding the secret of the Holy Grail was killed. And that's not suspicious. For some reason, (laughs) that evades suspicion. And even though it's the middle of the night, T-Bing, he's just like, oh, come on in. We can have a chat about the Grail. I love the bloody Grail. Let's get into it. And then he starts going on and on about, I don't know, Da Vinci's paintings and the Bible and, oh, Info Dump City. So let's continue with the info dump. So we start chapter 56 and we've just picked up from the bombshell that the Holy Grail is not a thing, it's a person. And Sophie's like, what? It's a what? It's a person. And Langton goes, yeah, actually it's a woman. (laughs) Women can be people too, Robert. (laughs) And from the blank look on Sophie's face, Langdon could tell that they had already lost her. She was like, yeah, you had me at person, but a woman, oh, no way. No bloody way, she thinks. Or maybe Langdon's just projecting that onto her because then he recalls having a similar reaction the first time he heard the statement that it was a woman. And it was not until he understood the symbology behind the grail that the feminine connection became clear. And at that point, T-Bing, he's like, yeah, Robert, you're the symbologist. Do you want to jump in here? So Langdon pulls out a, a pen from his pocket. He just had a pen in his pocket this whole time, apparently. And he draws the male and female symbols. You know, the little symbols, that circle with the little triangle and then that little circle with the little plus sign. And she's like, of course, I'm familiar with those symbols. And he says, well, guess what? I'm going to blow your freaking mind here, Soph but those are not the original symbols for male and female. (gasps) Like who gives a shit? (laughs) But many people incorrectly assume that the male symbol is derived from a shield and spear, while the female symbol represents a mirror reflecting beauty. Who who assumed that? uh, I've never assumed that. A a mirror reflecting beauty. A a circle and a plus sign does not a mirror reflection make. What? Who are these people that Robert thinks are just living their lives assuming things incorrectly about the male and female symbols? I don't think people are thinking about it that that much. And he's like, well, actually, you know what? They're really originated from ancient astronomical symbols for the planet god Mars and the planet goddess Venus. So he's really leaning into the whole men are from Mars, women are from Venus, like simplification. And he says their original symbols are far simpler. And so then he's drawing something else on the piece of paper. So he draws like an arrow, like a V shape, like a little upside down V. And he says, this symbol is the original icon for male, a rudimentary phallus. And Sophie says, quite to the point. And T-Bing's like, as it were, you know, a little bit of banter about a phallus. It's just an arrow. It's a little arrow. Pointing up. I don't know what's phallic about a V shape. Like just two lines coming towards a point. What what phalluses are you looking at, Langdon? That 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 looks like a phallus to you. You could say it looks like an arrow, perhaps. But he says this icon is formerly known as the blade, and it represents aggression and manhood. Since fucking when? It represents two lines squiggled onto a page. And he says, in fact, the exact phallus symbol is still used today on modern military uniforms. Uh, Stop saying phallus. It does not look like a phallus. And then he says the female symbol, as you might imagine, is the exact opposite. Why Why would she imagine that? I'm looking at my computer keyboard and there it is. And it's not a phallus. It's a little arrow thingy. So he says, moving on, the female symbol, as you might imagine, is the exact opposite and he draws another symbol and it's just, it's just a V shape. So it's the, it's the arrow shape upside down. And he says, this is called the chalice. And Sophie's like, whoa, of course it it looks feminine. (laughs) What? (laughs) She goes, oh, the chalice, it resembles a cup or a vessel. 
And he's like, yeah, yeah, it resembles a cup. Um, like, you know, like a holy grail. And it also resembles the shape of a woman's womb. I'm sorry. You were calling the other one a phallus and now this is meant to look like a womb. It looks like a V. It looks like the letter V. What wombs is he looking at? I mean, I don't know what a womb looks like, but I, I hazard to guess that it does not look like a, a V. Oh, brother. So then he says, Sophie, yeah, they think the Holy Grail's a cup, but describing it as a chalice is actually an allegory to protect the true nature of the Holy Grail. That's right, it's a metaphor. Oh, of course it is, it's a metaphor. And Sophie's like, oh my God, it's a metaphor for a woman. <sighs> he says, yep, the grail is the ancient symbol for womanhood and the Holy Grail represents the sacred feminine. Wh- wh- what a link to draw between just a couple of lines drawn on a page and wombs and the Holy Grail and the sacred feminine. Like he's connecting the dots and he's saying it like it's like it all makes sense. Like he's got this tone of authority and you're like, yeah, all right. That must be historical fact, but I don't think it is. Cause then he says the power of the female and her ability to produce life was once very sacred, but it posed a threat to the rise of the predominantly male church. And so the sacred feminine was demonized and called unclean. Why was giving birth to children a threat to the rise of the church? That- That also doesn't make sense to me because I thought the Pope was always being like, hey, you should knock people up and have babies. So I don't know why he's trying to let us believe that the church hates people being born. Is that what he's saying? And then Teabing, he's chiming in and he says, oh, by the way, the concept of woman as life bringer was the foundation of ancient religion. I mean, is it a concept? I mean, that does sort of sound like the kind of thing that JK Rowling would harp on about. But I wouldn't really call it a concept. Teabing says Christian philosophy decided to embezzle the female's creative power by ignoring biological truth and making man the creator. What the fuck are you talking? Something about Eve being created from Adam's rib. So women became an offshoot of men. So Genesis was the beginning of the end for the goddess. What the fuck are you talking about? That's embezzling females creative power. Creative, would you call it creative power just to have children? Like, oh, motherhood's beautiful. I'm not knocking it. Like, you know, praise be to all the mothers out there, but are you exercising like creative juices to pop a baby out? It's not like you're building the kid from the inside. Like you are, I know it. It's not a Lego piece is what I'm trying to say. You sort of get knocked up and then the body does the rest of the work. Like, am I wrong? Okay, let's move on. So Langdon says the grail is a symbol of the lost goddess. All the legends of trying to find the holy grail was just them trying to find the lost sacred feminine, apparently. (laughs) Ah, it's all bullshit. And Sophie's like, okay, this metaphor stuff's fun. But when you said that the holy grail was a person, I thought you meant an actual person. And Langdon's like, it is. And Teabing's like, and not just any person. A woman who carried with her a secret so powerful that if revealed, it threatened to devastate the very foundation of Christianity. I think she was probably dead by the time that this all got spun, but oh, okay. Sophie's like, who, who is this woman? Is she well known in history? And Teabing's like, of course she is. Quite well known. Just say it. But no, we've got to change rooms. Teabing's like, oh, well, if we'll just go to my study, I can then show you Da Vinci's painting of her. Like, oh, fuck me, dead. Whip out your laptop and type in Google and just pull it up. Like, oh, (sighs) okay. So they're about to change rooms. And then meanwhile, in the kitchen, the manservant, remember, because that's what we're calling him, Remy Legoludek. Okay, don't know why we need to know his surname, but Remy's watching the TV and the news station is broadcasting photos of two individuals to whom Remy had just served tea. End of chapter. So Remy's clocking that they're fugitives. I mean, obviously. Why would they really be rocking up in the middle of the night if they're not fugitives? So for chapter 57, we touch base back with Colette at the depository bank of Zurich. And so this arsehole, he's been waiting out the front of the bank like all night. And he's like, well, what's taken so long with this warrant? Ah, oh, what's taken so long? We've got to get in there. Um, they say that Sophie and Robert have already left. So why wouldn't they just let us in to have a little looky-loo? 
And he's like, it doesn't make sense. Meanwhile, he's not casting his mind back to that time that he let that truck leave the dock. Maybe cast your mind back to that little incident and just reflect on how you might not have made the best decision, but okay. So then Colette's phone rings and it's the command post at the Louvre. And they're like, forget about the bank. We got a tip. We have the exact location where Langdon and Niveau are hiding. And he's like, you're kidding. (laughs) And he says, yeah, I have an address in the suburbs somewhere near Versailles. Okay, well, you just said you knew the the exact location and then you can't say it. Oh, it's somewhere in Versailles. Like I'll tell you later. What? What, what's with the secrecy? And apparently Captain Fash, he's busy on a different call. So Colette's like, all right, we'll tell him I'm on my way and then get him to call me as soon as he's free. And he took down the address. I thought this place was famous. They call it Le Petit Versailles because it's like one of the most well-known chateaus in France, but he has to jot down the exact GPS coordinates to find the place. And so then as he's driving away from the bank, just abandoning that crime scene all altogether, um, he's like, well, actually I didn't, think to ask who had tipped off the DCPJ with their exact location. And he's like, hmm. And then he's like, nah, it doesn't matter. It says, none of that mattered. I think it kind of does matter. I mean, if you're going to do good police work, you should probably check your sources before leaving where they were last seen officially, the place you've been waiting to get a warrant for to search. He's just abandoned it because someone phoned in with a hot tip. What if it was them that had phoned in with the hot tip, Colette? You freaking idiot. And I don't know exactly if the implication is that Remy had called the cops. I don't think Remy did. I think, did they just triangulate it from the tracking device underneath the van that the bank found? So the bank called it in. Like, I guess it doesn't really matter. But Colette is a bad police officer. There, I said it. But he's driving away thinking he's killing it. He's like, oh, this will be the arrest that makes my career. (laughs) Your career's already in the toilet, dude. You fumbled the bag. And then in the same chapter, we cut to Silas, who's also pulling up to La Petite Versailles. Shit's coming to a head. And Silas sees that all of the lights were on in the chateau. And he's like, well, that's kind of odd at this hour. The teacher's information must have been accurate. And he says, I will not leave this house without the keystone. I will not fail the bishop and the teacher. The teacher's inside. Pretty ballsy of T-Bing as the teacher to get Silas to come and like rob him or conduct a home invasion at his place because he could have died. Got to pay respect to T-Bing. He's got balls. And then he checks his gun. Well, he checks the 13 round clip in his Heckler Kosh gun. Okay, so it's got 13 rounds in it. I I guess that's important for us to know. Let's, Let's see how many times he shoots it. Um, okay, so he, he's got his gun and then he hops over the fence. <laughs> he, just, he just scales the fence like he's Catwoman, climbs over it, falls down on the ground the other side, um, and he's in pain because he's still wearing that dumb little thing around his thigh that cuts into him. You know what? If you're going to go and like do armed robbery, maybe take off the torture device. Go sin, go commit the crimes, then go back to your dorm and whip yourself if you really need to self-flagellate so badly. I don't know why you've got this on still. Anyway, so then he starts the trek up the grassy slope to La Petite Versailles. So with that little bit of set dressing, we go back to chapter 58. We're in the study and Sophie's like, wow, this study is like no study I've ever seen before. It was six or seven times larger than even the most luxurious of office spaces. Six or seven, (laughs) what a a bizarre measurement. Could Dan Brown just not decide how big it was? And he was like, ah, six or seven, I'll figure it out later. And then just left it in the final draft of the novel. I don't know. Okay, so it looks like a hybrid of a science lab, a library and an indoor flea market. So he's a hoarder. He's living in an episode of Hoarders, just say it. And then T-Bing explains saying, I converted the ballroom. He says, I have very little occasion to dance. So I thought I'd use the space. Ah, classic. And she's like, wow, this is all for your work. And he says, yeah, learning the truth has become my life's love. Learning the truth has become my life's love. Get a girlfriend, get a boyfriend, get a vibrator. You're so boring, T-Bing. I mean, if you weren't a criminal mastermind, you'd be boring, but yeah. He says, the Sangreal is my favorite mistress. Creepy. And Sophie's like, oh, well, it is actually a woman. 
Sophie knows that woman's dead now, right? I don't know. I mean, I guess she's technically the Holy Grail, isn't she? Like, spoiler alert, she's, she's descendant of the bloodline of Christ. Um, so I guess she's technically the Holy Grail, which is ironic because she's like, wow, the Holy Grail, I can't believe it. It's a woman, who would have thought? And so Sophie's like, okay, so you said you have a picture of this woman who you claim is the Holy Grail. Which, which one is the painting? And Teabing's like, hmm, and he pretends that he's forgotten. I don't know why he's doing this, but he's like, let me see. The Holy Grail, the Song Real, the Chalice. What painting could it be? What possible painting could I be referring to? And then he wheels around and he spins and he points to a print of the Last Supper on the wall. And he's like, there she is. Like, oh my God. Cool. Yeah, Jets, we do not need this level of theatrics. What are you, P.T. Barnum at the circus? Dial it back. And also it was the image that she had just been looking at previously in the other room. (laughs) I don't know why you needed to move rooms. She was literally looking at a printout of the Last Supper because she was looking at the glasses on the table. Uh, But we have to move over to the larger portrait of it in the other room. Ah, the theatrics. And she says, um, that's the same painting you just showed me. (laughs) And he goes, yeah, I know, but it's bigger. (laughs) Oh God. Uh, And Langdon's like, yeah, the Holy Grail actually does make an appearance in the Last Supper. She's featured quite prominently. And Sophie's like, you fucking assholes. You just ridiculed me for not realizing that there's no big chalices on the table at the Last Supper. You made a whole big thing about it. You made me shut my eyes and think back and second guess everything I knew. It was a whole Mandela effect. And now you're telling me the Holy Grail is there. What the fuck? Now you're telling me it's a woman. This is a portrait of 13 dudes. What's going on? And t like, is it really a portrait of 13 dudes? take a closer look. And she's like, oh, Jesus Christ. So she walks up to the painting because she's like, well, it is bigger. I may as well inspect it. And she's like, yeah, 13. Jesus, six disciples on his left, six disciples on his right, like pretty clear cut. And she goes, they're all men. And he says, really? Oh, this again. He's like, oh, do you think so? Oh my God. And he says, how about the one seated in the place of honor at the right hand of the Lord? And she's like, looking and she's looking. And then she's like, holy shit. Oh, they got me, gal. They got me. A wave of astonishment rose within her because the individual had flowing red hair, delicate folded hands, and the hint of a bosom. It was without a doubt female. It was without a doubt female. Okay, no. So the guy had a lady face and and very nice hair. That doesn't mean he's a female. And I'm looking at the portrait right now. And if that's a hint of a bosom, then I'm stacked. I'm Pamela Anderson if that's a hint of a bosom. I'm I'm stacking more chess than that. Like uh, that covered up person. Oh, that's oh unmistakably a female. Yeah, right. Meanwhile, all of them don't even look that flash hot, really. Because it's a painting on a wall in a church in slash near Milan that almost got bombed out during the war, full of dust. They're they're only halfway through restoring the fucking thing practically. Like it's hundreds of years old. So excuse that guy for maybe not having features that look that manly. And that's the thing, T-Bing and Langdon are taking for granted that Leonardo da Vinci did all this stuff on purpose. What if he was a shit painter? Like, have we ever thought about that? Like, what if he was actually shit? And we'll look into that a bit more as well, because they're saying there's lots of like Easter eggs in this thing, but I think he just, he just fucked up. So Sophie's like, that's a woman. And Langdon's like, it sure is. And Teabing's like, ha ha ha. Yes, it's no mistake. Leonardo was skilled at painting the differences between the sexes. Was he? Was he? Because I thought we were also talking weeks ago about how the Mona Lisa might be him in drag. (laughs) So... I don't really know if he is that skilled at painting different sexes or if he's just flibbity flobbity jibbity bibbity when it comes to gender norms and gender expectations. I don't know. But now Sophie's fully convinced. So she's referring to it as the woman. <laughs> and she's like, who is this woman? <sighs> and although she had seen this classic image many times, she had not once noticed this glaring discrepancy. It can't be that glaring if you've never noticed it. And T-Bing says, yeah, everyone misses it. 
Our preconceived notions of this scene are so powerful that our mind blocks out the incongruity and overrides our eyes. Yeah, I don't know about that. And even Teabing's like, yeah, you might not have noticed it before because a lot of photos of the fresco are from back in the olden days when there was a lot of dust and grime on the fresco. So yeah, people might have missed it. I don't know how that helps his argument, but he's like, yeah, you know, shit changed. People made some restorations, but then they had to take those restorations off. And now we think that it's the original that's left. So basically someone could have come in, tarted up this disciple, smudged the edges, did a little bit of face tuning on John or Michael or whoever the guy is and made him look like Mary. Okay. Oh, that's not been revealed yet. They're just calling her the woman. So then Sophie's like, wow, who is she? And so that's when Teabing says that my dear is Mary Magdalene. And she's like, the prostitute. Okay. I mean, they're called sex workers, Sophie, please like put your prejudices aside. And don't use demonizing terminology, like, please. And Teabing, he goes, <gasps> as if he's offended as well. And he says, Magdalene was no such thing. <laughs> that unfortunate misconception is the legacy of a smear campaign launched by the early church. Tell you what, the early church were doing a lot of smear campaigns, weren't they? What are they, the Daily Mail? Just spreading shit around? He says the church needed to defame Mary Magdalene to cover up her dangerous secret and her role as the Holy Grail. And then he says, let me clarify, blah, 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 the Bible, they had to omit shit from the Bible so that Jesus didn't seem like a man and instead seemed like a divine being. So they had to cut out a lot of Mary Magdalene stuff, specifically her marriage to Jesus Christ. And Sophie's like, what? And he says, yeah, it's a matter of historical record. Is it? Like, you can't just say that and not back it up. But he's like, yeah, it's, it's historical fact, babe. They were married. And Da Vinci knew that fact. So the Last Supper practically shouts at the viewer that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were a pair. How so? (laughs) How so? Because I'm looking at it and they could not be leaning more away from each other. Yeah, maybe they're a pair that have been married for 20 years and hate each other because they're like, ugh. (laughs) Like, go, go Google it right now. Pull it up. She, if it's a she, she is leaning so far away from that fucker. She is not having a bar of him. She's like, you kept me up all night last night with your snoring. I'm sick of you. And he's like, well, I can't even look at you. And he's looking the other way. But according to Teabing, they're practically fucking in this fresco. Mm, I don't know. It shouts at the viewer. No one's ever noticed it for 400 years, but it practically shouts at the viewer. But he says, notice that Jesus and Magdalene are clothed as mirror images of one another. And she goes, sure enough, their clothes were inverse colors. Jesus wore a red robe and blue cloak, while Mary wore a blue robe and a red cloak. Yin and yang. Or Leo was just painting with a a couple of colors. Maybe he had some leftover reds and he said, I'll slop some over there. And then he had some leftover blue and he said, yeah, that's a different type of blue. Let's just slap that one over there. I don't know if it's that complex because I'm again I'm looking at it and some of the other guys have that same color blue and you know what I don't think they're the same color red she's got pink I mean his his red shirt sort of matches the other Doris at the end of the table's red shirt and just because you're both wearing red and blue does not a couple make and then Teabing tries to convince us that they appear joined at the hip and are leaning away from one another as if to create clearly delineated negative space between them. Yet they're leaning away from each other. I don't know how you're trying to spin that. And they don't look together at the hip. They're barely touching wrists. Unless they've got gigantic hips, those hips aren't touching. And then Teabing says, if you look at the negative space, (laughs) and he draws it for her, he says it creates the indisputable V shape. And it was the same symbol Langdon had drawn earlier for the grail, the chalice and the female womb. It's a V. I don't think it means anything. And then Teabing's like, and on top of that, if you view them as compositional elements rather than people, you will see another obvious shape leap out at you. A letter of the alphabet. Okay, different to the V. That's apparently a chalice, which is apparently a womb. There's a different letter and and the lines make an M. 
But again, I don't really see that either. How is he like, there's an M hidden in the painting. I, I don't really believe there is. And he says, yeah, a bit too perfect for coincidence, wouldn't you say? Coincidence? I, I, don't, I don't see it. He's like, yep, there's an M. People will say it stands for Matrimonio or Mary Magdalene. Nobody's certain. The only certainty is that the hidden M is no mistake. What? How, how are we certain there's an M there? I do not see it. You know what? Hey, how about a W? You know what? I think I see an F there in the window in the background. Why not? There's an M hidden in the painting. My fucking ass. Uh, and so he's like, yeah, this can't be a coincidence. It doesn't exist. And Sophie, she says, I'll admit, the hidden M is intriguing. What? Although I assume nobody is claiming it's proof of Jesus' marriage to Magdalene. And Teabing's like, nah, 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 that's a matter of historical record, of course. What record? And then he says, Jesus as a married man makes more sense than our standard biblical view of Jesus as a bachelor. Because according to Jewish custom, celibacy was condemned and it was the obligation of a Jewish person to find a suitable wife and father sons. Mm. So if he wasn't married, at least one of the gospels would have mentioned it and offered some explanation for his unusual state of bachelorhood. What the, he's grasping at straws here, just acting like all the gospels are real. Like, I've got news for you, Teeping. They made some shit up. I don't think you can call it a full historical record when he's turning water into wine and he's feeding people with all those fish and those loaves of bread. Uh, I mean, he walked on fucking water. Like, uh, uh, talk about a metaphor. I think that's a metaphor. So then he pulls out some photocopies of the Dead Sea Scrolls. (laughs) All right, as you do. Just had that lying around. And he says, the earliest Christian records don't match up with the gospels in the Bible. Yeah, uh, no fucking shit. So then he reads the gospel of Philip, whoever he is, and he says, the companion of the savior is Mary Magdalene. Christ loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on her mouth. Ooh, get it, girl. And the rest of the disciples were offended by it and expressed disapproval. They said to him, why do you love her more than all of us? God, those jealous things. And Sophie's like, doesn't say anything about marriage. And Tabing says, au contraire. So he hates the French people, but he's happy enough to speak French. And he says, au contraire, the word companion in those days meant spouse. Great, there's your proof. (laughs) Oh, that's all the proof I needed, I'm convinced. And Sophie's like, yeah, all right. I, I guess that's pointing to them having a romantic relationship. How about that? And so then she's having a little flashback because it's the Da Vinci Code, so we can't go a few chapters without a flashback. And so she's flashing back to some angry priest knocking on Jacques Sunier's door when she was a kid. And the priest was like, is this the home of Jacques Sunier? And he was holding out a newspaper. And he says, I want to talk to him about this editorial that he wrote. So Sophie's like, all right, we'll go and have a talk to my granddad, whatever. So Jacques and this angry priest, they sit down and have a chat. Meanwhile, Sophie walks on over to the newspaper and she has a little geese. And they're talking about the movie, The Last Temptation of Christ. And apparently Sonia was like, hey, don't ban the movie just because Jesus liked to have sex with Mary Magdalene, like big fucking whoop. And so the priest is screaming, being like, it's porn, it's porn, it's sacrilege. How can you endorse that? And then the priest is slamming the door on the way out. How the priest found the home of Jacques Sunier just from reading an editorial in the newspaper, I'm not too sure. Maybe Jacques needed to unlist his address on some documents and things, but yep, I guess he's just being hunted down by priests. That, that's the least ridiculous thing to have happened in this book so far. So then young Sophie, she says, hey, granddad, do you really think Jesus had a girlfriend? And he's like, yeah, well, so what have you did? And she's like, yeah, good point. I wouldn't mind. Okay, then we're back in the present. That was a valuable little sidebar. Well, we all, we all really learned a lot from that, didn't we? And then Teabing, he says, I shan't bore you with the countless references to Jesus and Magdalene's union. Countless references. I'm sure there's not that many. It's been explored ad nauseum by modern historians. Has it? And then he reads out from the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. And Sophie's like, I didn't know she had a gospel. Remember she said she knew nothing about the Bible. And here she is like, she knows 
every gospel that exists, apparently. She's the freaking gospel expert all of a sudden. So then he's quoting the gospel of Mary Magdalene. And there's this section where Levi and Peter are having a chat about how he loved her more than us. Like, oh, the savior loves this woman. She's the best. And I'm like, yeah, Mary Mary would write that. (laughs) Like, are we really taking this as an accurate source? Like, she's obviously biased. Like, talk about fake news. She wrote that gospel. She's spinning shit. She's not going to say he didn't love her the most. And then they talk about how Peter was jealous of Mary because he might've been a bit of a sexist. Or he was gay and had the hots for Jesus. Like, let's just make up anything at this point. And T-Bing's like, oh, and by the way, Peter is not the person who Jesus wanted to make the church once he was dead. He wanted the church to be carried out by a woman, Mary Magdalene. And she's like, what, a woman? Like, oh my God, yeah, sure. And T-Bing says, yeah, that was the plan. Jesus was the original feminist. Okay, put that on a t-shirt. Jesus was the original feminist. (laughs) Oh, that's who he was. I was wondering who created feminism, but it was Jesus, everyone. Stand down. Stand down, everyone. We found him. We found the first feminist. It was Jesus. (laughs) He was also the world's first suffragette. Thanks, Jesus. And Langdon, he's charming in, because he's like, I'm still here, guys. Yeah, Peter had a problem because he didn't want the church to be carried on by a woman. So he's in the Last Supper and he's got this menacing hand. He's leaning menacingly toward Mary Magdalene and slicing his blade-like hand across her neck. The same threatening gesture as in the Madonna of the Rocks, exclamation mark. Or perhaps Da Vinci's not good at drawing hands. Do we think that might be it? Like, or, like trend alert, he can't draw hands. But also, again, I'm looking at it. To me, it kind of looks like he's just got his hand on her slash him's shoulder. Uh, it doesn't really look like he's trying to decapitate her with his hand, like what? And so then Langdon says, and look here too. And he's pointing at the crowd of disciples near Peter. He says, this is a bit ominous, right? And Sophie's squinting and she's like, whoa, is that a hand wielding a dagger? And he says, yep. And stranger still, if you count the arms, you'll see that this hand belongs to no one at all. It's disembodied, anonymous. So again, Da Vinci drew an extra limb, I think accidentally. I think he cocked up and drew one too many hands. And now he's like, oh God, I can't paint over it. I'll just say it's an Easter egg got something to do with the church and how Peter hated Mary Magdalene because he's a sexist. Let's just run with that. And Sophie's like, guys, can we just take a step back? I still don't get how all of this makes Mary Magdalene the Holy Grail. And T-Bing says, therein lies the rub. Why does he talk like this? Ah, therein lies the rub. Few people realize, few people, apparently all of history knows this, but few people realize that Mary Magdalene was a powerful woman already. So apparently she was of royal descent from the tribe of Benjamin. Great, who cares? And so she was recast as a whore in order to erase evidence of her powerful family ties. Why would the church ever care if she was of royal blood? Because Jesus was of royal blood. And so if they ever had kids, that would be a mixing of both houses. Very Game of Thrones fire and blood-esque. You know, the Targaryens, they do like to mix their bloodline with their own bloodline. And uh, I don't know. So this is what this is sort of like. They're like, wow, a child of two bloodlines would have been unstoppable. Jesus fused two royal bloodlines, creating a potent political union with the potential of making a legitimate claim to the throne. Whose throne? What throne? And restoring the line of kings as it was under Solomon. Okay. All right. Sure. Uh, Yep. So then they're like, okay, so it's about royal blood. Do you get it now, royal blood? When the Grail legend speaks of the chalice that held the blood of Christ, they're talking about the womb that held the bloodline of Christ. Yuck, like, do we, do we really need to talk like this? And then Sophie, she's two steps behind. She's like, wait a minute. How could Christ have a bloodline unless... And then she looks at Langdon and he's like, yeah, they fucked. Like they had a, they had a kid. It, that's what we're getting at here. And she's like, why? Cause you know, Sophie's a prude. She is quite the kink shamer. She doesn't like the idea of old people having sex. 
She doesn't like the idea of anyone having sex, let alone a granddad in a basement. So she's like, Jesus having sex, gross. And so T Bing's like, yep, they had a kid. It's the greatest cover up in human history. Again, but countless historians have talked about it. Jesus Christ was married, he was a father, and Mary Magdalene was the holy vessel. Um, I'd rather just call her Mary. Like, do we have to call her the holy vessel? She was the chalice that bore the royal bloodline of Christ. Like, I, I guess she's a person. She's not a chalice. She was the womb. No, no, she had a womb. She wasn't the womb. But he says, she was the womb that bore the lineage and the vine from which the sacred fruit sprang forth. Okay. She's not a bottle of wine. What are we talking about here? I feel like he's talking about bloody Chardonnay grapes. Well, she's a woman. Stop reducing her to giving birth. Isn't that what you were just bitching about what the church did? And Sophie's like, but how could a secret that big be kept quiet for all these years? And Tebing's like, it's not been quiet. Have you not been fucking listening? And she says, so those Sangreal documents, they contain proof that Jesus had a royal bloodline. I mean, how do they do that? Are there DNA tests in those Sangreal documents? Was there a 23andMe test hidden under that old ruin of Solomon's temple? Is that what we're talking about? Some of Christ's fingernails and a vial of Mary's spit? Like what? But no, apparently, yeah, it holds the proof. And then T-Bing drops the bomb that Sangreal derives from San Grial, but also Sangreal, meaning royal blood. Didn't we already have this conversation or was Sangreal also meaning something else? There is just so much meaning to be found in the term Sangreal. That's the end of that chapter. Okay, fuck, spare me. Little mini one to end on. So chapter 59, we're with the male receptionist in the lobby of the Opus Dei headquarters on Lexington Avenue in New York City, <laughs> who was surprised to hear Bishop Aaron Garos's voice on the line. Okay, do we need to know he's a male receptionist? Is that because Opus Dei is so sexist they only hire male staff to be front facing customer service operators? Or is Dan Brown sexist for assuming that we would assume that receptionist on its own would be a female character. And he's like, well, haha, <laughs> no, it's not. It's a male character. Whereas, you know, we don't need to gender the receptionist because they're the most minor character in the book. Okay. But so the bishop's like, hey, I'm calling because I want to see if I've got any messages. He's flapping about, remember, because he was off in Rome without any phone reception. And he was like, oh no, I'm, I'm getting ghosted by the teacher. Oh no, I got to call the teacher back. And he's like, did I get any messages? And this guy's like, yeah, you know what you did actually? They didn't leave a name, just a number, but they said it was urgent. The call is in Paris. He said to contact him immediately. And he's like, oh my God, thank you. I've been waiting for the call. Like, oh my God. Did his mobile phone break? Like he had to call Opus Day headquarters on Lexington Avenue in New York City. <laughs> do we need the street coordinates every time we visit this location? Like, I don't think we do. But so he had to call in and get messages like from an answering service. Well, oh, it was a wild time, this 2004 or five or six or whenever this was made, jeepers creepers. And so then, we're, oh, we're back with the male receptionist after they hang up. He's like, wow, why is Aaron Garos's phone reception so bad? Sounds like he's in another country. <laughs> um, and then the receptionist shrugs it off and is like, oh, Arangarossa be Arangarossa. Why are we in his point of view right now? Like, do we care? Do, do any of us care? We know Arangarossa's in Europe. Who gives a fuck what the receptionist thinks about the phone reception? And so Arangarossa's at the airport again. He's flying to France. And so he's thinking, oh, it's a, it must be a good sign that the teacher has called in. Something must have gone well tonight. So then he calls. And the DCPJ answers and it's a female voice. Why do we need to know it's a female voice? This book is so preoccupied with gendering people, isn't it? God, even an image in The Last Supper is getting gendered beyond belief. JK Rowling and Dan Brown, they, they would get along, I believe. So the female voice is saying, it's the DCPJ, bonjour, hello, how can I help you? It's the DCPJ. And so he's like, what? The DCPJ? He was expecting to call the teacher. Long story short, Fash left him a message. So then Fash comes on the line and he says, Bishop, I'm glad I finally reached you. I have much to discuss. I mean, I assume it's Fash. Doesn't actually tell us it's Fash. Just says it's a man with a tone that's gruff. So yeah, sounds like Fash to me. And that's the end of that chapter. Jiminy Crickets. And I'm just, I'm not going to cover it, but I'm just flipping the page. And yep, chapter 60 is just another info dump about the grail. Oh, oh. All right, 
Well, I'm going to take a few days off and tackle that one. And I'll, I'll, I'll be back next week to, to go on about the grail. Okay. Bye. Send your burning thoughts, frustrations, and grievances on this latest chapter of this shitty book to BreakingDownPod at gmail.com or on Twitter at PodBreakingDown and Instagram at BreakingDownBadBooks. You can visit www.BreakingDownBadBooks.com for all the listen links, contact information, merch, and more. To support the show on Patreon and gain access to exclusive ad-free bonus episodes, visit patreon.com slash BreakingDownBadBooks. Ratings and reviews on your preferred podcast platform are also a fun, free way to support the show. Breaking Down Bad Books is hosted by me, Nathan Brown, who you can follow on Instagram and Twitter at NathanBrown90. Thanks for listening and happy reading. 